Greetings and welcome to this online edition of Bioanalytical Chemistry. All right, this is our first online video session and we're picking up where we left off in class having discussed uh, non-competitive immunoassays as well as a variety of ways to modify the antibodies involved in those assays and attach labels. Uh, and we've been talking predominantly about heterogeneous non-competitive immunoassays. So today uh, in this video module, we're going to talk about competitive Amino assays, what those look like, what those data look like, and um, the any special considerations that we have to make as we design a competitive assay. So I'm going to use a format where uh, you'll be able to see me taking notes on a screen as if I was writing on the board in class, and that'll enable you to take notes as we go. There's a little bit of a lag, so we just all have to be patient with the system, but I think this will be the most similar to our in-class experience. All right, so we just finished talking about non-competitive immunoassays, uh, and in particular, the heterogeneous format. And you may recall that those are set up where we usually have an antibody on the plate, uh, and the antibodies are present in excess compared to the antigen. Um, and then we add to this a mixture of antigen um, that is usually coming from the sample. And then from there, we may go on, and there's a variety of different detection methods, and the ones that we've talked about a lot are the sandwich immunoassay where you come in with a, a, a subsequent antibody, uh, your detection antibody, and it's got some kind of label on it that we can detect. And this, um, as we see over on the right, um, it gives us this property where there's a, a linear range on the curve um, where we get a good uh, linearity of signal to analyte uh, and then above and below that, there are flatter regions of the curve. So we get this sigmoidal type curve where it's going up with the concentration of antigen. Okay, so that's all well and good. Uh, if you have a system where you can have two antibodies available, um, or there are, of course, single antibody versions of non-competitive assays, uh, but there are times where these types of assays are insufficient. And so in that case, we can use another type of assay called the competitive assay. Um, and here, um, really the distinguishing characteristic is that unlike the non-competitive assay where the antibody was in excess, here we're going to use that the antigen is in excess, or in particular, it's the analyte is in excess. So occasionally you might see an assay where it's flipped and the, you're actually trying to detect the antibody and the antibody is the analyte. In that case, we would flip it. So the analyte, um, you really need to be in excess for this competitive assay. And what it's competing for is binding to its target. So um, here, the typical setup uh, is actually um, similar at first to what we were doing for the non-competitive assay. So we still often have a plate if it's a heterogeneous format, and then we still are coding with an antibody. Okay, but the difference is now, in order to ensure that the analyte is in excess, we actually add a lot of excess antigen to the system in addition to the antigen that came from our sample. So whereas above the antigen all came from sample, meaning it came from the cell culture media or the blood or urine sample that we're analyzing, here we're going to add in a mixture of antigen that came from the sample an antigen that we add, which is a lab reagent, and it's a labeled antigen. Okay, so this is a labeled reagent that we have to produce in advance and have a stock of in the lab. And so some of this antigen is from the sample and it's not labeled, meaning that we can't detect its presence um, other than by assay. And then some of it is actually labeled, and I'll draw that as having a star. So we have now this labeled form of the antigen that we can detect. Let's say you put a fluorophore on it, for example. That would be one way to label. Um, and so now these two things compete for binding to the antibody. Um, and so what we end up with bound is uh, after the assay um, is a mixture. So we still have to rinse away 
but you have a mixture of labeled and unlabeled Uh, and I've sorted them here by accident, but so you get the idea. So we have a mixture of labeled and unlabeled antigen that bound to the to the antibody, and then you just read that out. And so if it's a fluor four, you'd be doing a fluorescent readout. If it's enzymatic, you would add a substrate um, and detect the signal from the substrate. So um, we can use a variety of labels here, like what we've talked about previously in class. But the key idea is that you're competing for binding. Okay. Um, one thing that we have to assume, um, and that's really important, is that we have to design this reagent so that uh, the label doesn't interfere with the binding to the antibody. Okay, so if it does interfere, then of course, um, that will affect the ability for the labeled one to compete uh, for, for binding with the, with the real antigen, and then you won't be able to get the proper signal, okay? So we have to design this so that we don't interfere with binding to the antibody, okay? All right, so what does the signal look like from this type of assay? Recall, um, I'll scroll back, that with this non-competitive assay, we had this positive sigmoidal relationship between the signal and the concentration of analyte. So I would ask you, do you think that that holds when doing competition? Okay, so let's try to draw um, again, uh, like say what, what would this curve look like as a function of analyte concentration um, and trying to measure whatever the signal is. Okay, so pause the video and ask yourself, at low concentrations of, of analyte, is my signal high or low? And at high concentrations, is it high or low? And then what would that relationship in between look like? Is it linear, nonlinear, is it sigmoidal? So what, what should that look like? So pause the video and then you can come back. All right, so hopefully you gave this a try. Um, and so here, if we ask ourselves, what would happen if there was no labeled analyte? Let's look at this drawing on the left um, over here, where if there was no labeled analyte, um, you would have binding only by labeled, labeled reagent, right? So the signal should be very high, all right? So we're gonna start the assay way up here at the top on our graph. And then at the highest concentrations of analyte from the sample, then there should be no more room. So here, everything is bound and labeled, okay? And then way up here, um, at the highest concentrations of analyte, everything is unlabeled, all right? So now we should be having either zero signal or more accurately, it would be whatever the background signal is from the assay, okay? So we expect to be down here. This is our background from whatever the readout modality is. If it's fluorescence, it might be the autofluorescence of the plate that you're reading in, for example, whatever the background is. And then in between those two, we should have this nice sigmoidal relationship, okay? So we have this linear in the middle and then flat at the top and the bottom once again. Um, and we might ask, why does it level off at the lowest concentrations of analyte? And that is often a sensitivity issue is that we can't always tell the difference um, at the uh, because there's not enough competition happening up here in this uh, regime where there's very low concentrations to compete. Okay. All right. So that's a competitive immunoassay. Um, and I'm going to share with you um, a few self check questions and you can ask yourself if you really um, have grasped it. All right, so first, going back to the non-competitive immunoassay, which is what we learned before. For non-competitive assay, ask yourself which component is limiting, which components are in excess, and are all the antibody binding sites occupied at the end of the assay? Okay, so are there are all the antibody occupied binding sites filled with antigen? All right, so take a minute and answer that. You can pause the video, and then I'll show you the answers. All right, so I'm moving to the answers. All right, and here they are. So, oopsie, hopefully this is working. All right, so again, in a non-competitive assay, it's the antigen that is limiting and it's uh, binding to an excess of antibodies. And that would be for any antibodies in the assay if there's just one um, 
or, or if it's a sandwich assay, then you have both capture and detection. So all the antibodies need to be in excess compared to the antigen. And then at the end, again, because those antibodies are in excess, not all the spots are filled. Okay, so here's the next set of questions. Now for a competitive assay, it's the same questions. So walk yourself through those and then pause the video if you need to. And now I'm gonna move on to the answers. So here it's the antibody that is limiting, which means the antigen has to be in excess. And the way that we guarantee that is by adding a flood of the labeled antigen reagent, which means that even when there's zero analyte in the system uh, that you're measuring in the biological sample, there will always be an excess of antigen because we made sure of that by adding, okay? And as a result, all the antibody, antibody binding sites should be occupied at the end of the assay, and we've guaranteed that by having this high concentration of analyte, um, even when the unlabeled analyte in the sample is low. Okay, so that's the end of this one on competitive immunoassays, and the next video will walk you through homogeneous immunoassays.